The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Let's say it's a bright summer day with the sky high and blue and you are half dozing in the shade of a tree out in the country or on your patio. A dense, dark shadow passes over you and for the briefest moment, you shudder to the marrow of your bones with such intense cold that for that moment, heart, breathing, feeling, life stops dead. You open your eyes and look up. But there is nothing in the clear sky. Then you will know that over you has passed one of the ghost planes. The plane always come down this fast. Well, it depends on the pilot. This one seems to be quite a cowboy. Well, it's hard to hear. My ears are kind of stopped up. You can I... pinch your nose like this. Huh? Blow gently. Is it better? Uh... Yes, Mr. Moss. Now, listen to me. I don't know what you plan to do, but when we land, whatever it is, I'm getting off this plane. If you take my advice, I advise you to do the same thing. Our mystery drama, The Ghost Plane, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Richard Crenna and Janet Waldo. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When you say Budweiser When you say Budweiser Of Bush, St. Louis. Wherever you live in Chicagoland, you're less than 30 minutes or two gallons from a Dragon Inn fine Mandarin restaurant with more than 10 years' experience pleasing customers from 42 states and 12 foreign countries. Delicious Dragon Inn Mandarin dining is near you now. Visit Dragon Inn North, 1650 Waukegan Road, Glenview. Enjoy the fascinating flavors of hot and sour soup, shrimp saute, filet mandarin, shikwan, diced chicken, and black mushrooms with bamboo shoots. This authentic Mandarin dinner has been carefully planned to delight you. Dragon Inn North Quiet Harmony was designed to give you the repose necessary to enjoy a delicious meal. It's air of leisure to relax and refresh you. Come to Dragon Inn North. Seek the unusual and different. You will leave knowing you've had a memorable experience because we want you to come again. Phone 729-8383. That's 729-8383 for a Dragon Inn North Mandarin dinner reservation. intents and purposes, the plane in which we are traveling is not different from any normal jet, a 707 or perhaps a DC-9, with two exceptions, perhaps. There is no first class, as if it were a charter plane, and it carries only two lone passengers, both of them apparently asleep. There are other, many other differences in this plane. But I leave you to discover those for yourself. 
Wake up, Jenny. Wake up, Jenny. Wake up, Jenny. Wake up, Jenny. Where... Where am I? A plane? I wasn't going on a plane, was I? Who was I? If I am, where to? What for? I can't be awake. It doesn't feel... And yet I'm... I'm not asleep, I know that. I can hear the engines. Feel the vibration. There's a stewardess. Except she looks so old. I never saw an old stewardess on a plane before. But at least I can ask her. Oh, why did she have to stop by him? I hope they don't talk too long. Herb Moss, wake up. Herb Moss, wake up. Herb Moss, wake up. Have fallen asleep. It's funny, I don't feel tired. I can't remember. Chicago, St. Louis. No, I didn't have an out of town trip this week. No, did I? It wasn't half at the lake. Yes, well, then, how. Oh, Stortus. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Uh, the seatbelt light is out, so I guess it's safe to smoke. In the rear of the plane, it is permitted to smoke. Oh, thanks. Yeah, how about rustling me up a double martini real dry to go with that? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Moss. There are no drinks served on this plane. Not even a little wine with dinner? No meals I served either. No, that's the way it is with charter flights, hmm? You could call this a charter flight, yes, sir. It's not a through flight, I guess. There'll be some set-downs. That's correct, sir. Well, I hope for your sake business wasn't all that bad. Just two of us. How many are you expecting at the next stop? I don't know that yet. Excuse me. I think I'm wanted up front, Mr. Moss. May I be of assistance, Miss Wallace? I I know you're going to think this is real dumb of me, but I, I fell asleep and... Waking up, I'm so spaced out, I, I can't remember. I mean, where are we going? I'm sorry, dear. I'm not allowed to tell you that. You mean I, I'm some sort of prisoner? Oh, no. No, not at all. You can go anywhere in the plane you like, except the cockpit, of course. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think perhaps the captain wants to talk to me. Well, no, wait. Wait, please. Oh, just a minute. Uh, uh, there, there's so many things I want to ask you. I it really wouldn't do any good. I wouldn't be able to answer. Well, just one thing. Is is this some sort of a, a hospital plane or something? I've told you all I can tell you. Oh, Lord, what is it? Some awful dream. I'm scared. Mom, Mom. Someone, please. I'm so scared. Oh, excuse me, miss. Oh. Uh, hi. Hello. I, uh... Well, there are only two of us on the whole plane, so, uh... Well, to tell you the truth, I could use some company. Uh, so could I. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll slide over so you can sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is, uh... Just a, just a minute. I, I should have my... Uh, yeah, it's my business card. Herbert Moss. I'm in... Uh, I'm with Troy Train and Kenward. That's, that's an advertising firm. Well, as long as we're talking together, I think I should ask your name. Me? Oh, it's Ginny. Uh, Ginny, she called me. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look in my bag. There there ought to be... Oh, yeah, here. My dent card. Ginny Wallace. That's me. Lousy picture. <laughs> no, not at all. Nobody your age takes a bad picture. You, uh... You also didn't seem to be sure of your name, Ginny. Ginny, right? <laughs> But don't look so scared, dear. You have company. Why do you 
think I went groping for my business card. I wasn't sure of mine either. No kidding. You weren't honest? Honest. I'll tell you more than that. I don't know how I got on this plane. Do you? No. Hmm. And I can bet you something else. You probably don't know where this plane is headed for, do you? No, I don't. And the stewardess wouldn't tell me. Or me. Another thing. I've looked through all my pockets and I can't find any carbon copy of my ticket, luggage checks, anything like that. I, I feel so scared. You don't think it's like, like, well, like one of those skyjack things and where, where the hostage is like, I mean, well, I could figure you, but why me? Skyjack. No, I, I don't know. It's possible, except... That... Except what? Well, why don't we know who we are? Remember where we're going. Let's try some questions. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Sure. Uh, uh, two sisters and a brother. How old are they? Uh, younger than me. Mary's 14, Margaret's 11, and uh, Tommy's only 7. Yeah. And your mother and father? Pop. Pop died a while back. Mom's alive. Mm. You live with the family? No, I... Uh, I was going to say I, I didn't anymore, but... Well, it, it's going sort of blank again. All right, now let's, let's not push it. Or you. All right, let's think about me. Well, uh, we know you work at an advertising agency. What do you do there? I'm an account executive, vice president in charge of Magnum Brands. Well, I bet you live outside the city and travel in commuter trains with bar cars and all like that. And I, I bet, I bet you're married, right? With kids near my age? Yes, yes. Brian's at college already and Adrienne is... Yes, yes, of course I'm married and I live in Greenridge. Hey, wait a minute. There's, there's a picture of the kids a couple of years ago and it's my wife, Nina. Here's some other pictures of the kids. <laughs> and that's the house. And this one, too. Oh, beautiful. Oh, whoops, oh, you dropped one. Um, who's this? Hmm? Oh, that's my secretary, Barbara. Oh, good Lord. What is it, Mr. Moss? Well, nothing. <laughs> no, it's nothing. I, uh, I forgot to leave her some, some instructions about a meeting. I... I, what what day is this? I don't know. I don't even know the day. I have a feeling it's terribly important for us to know just what this day means. To both of us. Oh. Jenny, what is it? Oh, just the way you said it. You gave me goosebumps all over. I know the feeling. I don't like anything about this. Look, on a plane like this, there should be more than one hostess. I'm going up front to get some information about where this plane is going. Why don't you go aft and see if there isn't another hostess in the galley? You mean like in the back? Yes, I'm going to check the pilot. Okay, Mr. Moore. Pilot? Pilot or somebody, I want to talk to you. I demand that you open this door. This is your captain. Will all passengers please notice that the no smoking lights are on and that seat belts be fastened. Please resume your seats immediately. We are preparing to land. Passengers will resume their seats immediately and buckle their seat belts. Please put out all cigarettes. We are preparing to land. Oh, we're falling, Mr. Mahan. The plane is falling. No, it's all right, Jenny. We're just diving a bit deeply. That's oh, all. I feel kind of sick to my stomach. Now, slide my in and sit ears. down. Sit down. Oh. That's a girl. Oh. Now, keep your mouth open and swallow. Oh. And fasten your seatbelt. Oh. Hold up tight. Oh. Now, listen to me. Oh. I don't know what you plan to do, but when we land, whatever it is, I'm getting off this plane. I'd advise you to do the same. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've only got a couple of dollars. Don't worry about that. I've got money and credit cards. Oh. Want to get off with me? Oh, yes. yes. The moment I tell you to, snap open your seatbelt and head with me for the exit. This is your captain. We are about to land. Remain in your seats, as this will be a short stop. Do not unfasten your seatbelts on land. We shall be taking off immediately. 
pig's eyes. Dad! They were down. It's funny. I never heard him drop that landing gear. Are we all right? Hmm. Now, as soon as we come to a halt, snap open your seatbelt and follow me. Oh, yes, Mr. Mars. Okay, now. Oh, oh, I, I can't. The buckle won't open. As soon as I get mine. Oh, damn. Oh, I knew something was up. I sure would like to know what the devil is going on. What is it, Mr. Mars? These damn belts are gimmicked somehow. We're trapped in our seats. Whoever they are, they're not going to let us get off. Who are they? I don't know, Ginny. I'm afraid even to think. Still, it is a good question. Who are they? Where is this strange plane headed with its cargo of only two passengers? Why is the hostess an elderly woman? And what is the rest of the crew like? And why have they stopped at, uh, wherever they have stopped, and, and who else or what else is coming aboard? I'll return shortly with Act Two. Here at Red Cross National Headquarters in Washington, D.C., there is a special little place to visit, a small museum reflecting a great many years of service to the American people. A hall of mercy. Down this corridor, history comes to life. A history of people helping people. There are photographs, documents, and memorabilia of Red Cross assistance during times of peace, of national crisis, and times of natural disaster. From the Civil War years to the 1970s, great Americans are remembered here. Dedicated Red Cross volunteers who developed the vast blood program, community health and safety programs, in addition to youth service activities. And the list goes on. Yes, this is a special museum. A small tribute to those who are ever extending a helping hand just like a good neighbor. And that's what the Red Cross is all about. Northwest Federal Savings has just made a handsome cut in the high cost of everyday dining. You can now build a beautiful set of fine stainless flatware with the weighted balance of fine silver and save at the same time. A six-piece place setting yours for $1.95 with each $25 deposit. If your life is contemporary, Dorette is for you. Simple, clean cut with a Mediterranean influence. Or delicate Lisette, the classic scroll and rose design that makes you think of fine linen and crystal. Six-piece place setting, $1.95 with each $25 deposit. Or choose the Jefferson Manor, the pistol handle flatware originally designed by Paul Revere. Satin finish, delightfully versatile. And with each place setting, you'll receive a matching service piece free. From sugar shell to serving spoons, eight in all. Collect as many place settings as you need. A beautiful idea. Come see, come save. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. strange plane rests on the ground, its engines idling easily, and nothing happens. In their seats, Ginny Wallace and Herb Ross have given up struggling with the seat belts, which refuse to unclasp, pinning them helplessly in their seats. The cockpit door remains closed. The sense of unimaginable and pending action is so palpable that both have dropped their voices almost to a whisper. Can you see where we are out the window? Nothing. Now rub the window off. I can't reach. I did, but it's just that white mist. Sort of like a cloud. I mean, outside. No lights? No movement you can see? No. What's going to happen to us? I don't know. Who is that? Shh. Bring them on board. Who is it? I can't see over the back of the seat. I don't know about the passengers, but it's the stewardess who was up front. How did she get to the rear of the plane? I don't know. That's it. Mr. Schaefer in K-1. Strap him in and... Stewardess? In a moment, Mr. Morris. Miss Newman in S-1. And Mr. Downing in S-2. Make them secure. Stewardess, I demand to be released and let off at this stop. Thank you, boy. As soon as you're out, we'll button up and take off. Stewardess! Do you hear me? I... 
Didn't you hear? Why won't you listen? We are in the takeoff run. Please do not smoke and make sure that all safety belts are fastened. Do not release until a light goes on. Do not release. Collapse. Who has a chance? Can't you stop it, Mr. Moss? Some way. Yes, I can't, Tim. I think you must be beginning to realize that as well as I do. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up. Where am I? What is this? A plane? Are you quite comfortable, Mr. Schaefer? Who the devil are you? The stewardess. You've got to be kidding. An old team like you? Hey, what kind of an airline is this, anyhow? At the proper time, you'll know. Excuse me, I have other passengers to attend to. Wake up, Carol Newman. Carol Newman. Carol Newman. Carol Newman. I don't want to wake up. I don't ever want to wake up. I took care about that. What am I doing on a plane? This guy next to me. I don't fly tourist. Wait a minute. Let me think. Wake up, Bruce Downing. Wake up, Bruce Downing. No. Oh, no, I couldn't. Not now. Not now. I, I made the big chance. I can't blow it. I can't. Only I have. I know it. Damn motor is still running. It, it's still. What? I'm not under the car. I, I'm on a plane. It, it's all right. It must be all right. Quite all right, Mr. Downing. Yeah? Uh-huh. I say for the moment, it's quite all right. Where are we headed? On the passage you booked. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to make quite a few preparations. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, we're... Damn! What's the matter with this buckle? He's messing around with it. I tried. Some new safety gimmick, I suppose. Won't release till the seatbelt light goes off. Oh, well. What's the difference? You mind if I smoke? No. If you have a stick, I'll join you. Oh, oh no grass, ma'am. I mean, I'm strictly keep off the grass these days. Just straight old filter tip. Did I ask for anything more? <sighs> You didn't have to. We're two of a kind, right? And what does that mean? We've been down a lot of the same roads. Yeah. I've been down the same roads, I guess. Just a few more of them than you, Sonny. Well, you weather pretty well. And a couple of years doesn't give you any right to that Sonny. You can call me... Bruce, uh... Bruce, uh... Bruce will do. I'm Carol. I've got a case of the who the hell am I, how did I get here blues, too. I was hoping you could clue me in. About what, for example? Well, this flight. Where we're going. How I got here. I think I'd be much help. You notice what I'm wearing? Yeah. It's, uh, nice. Sort of, uh... I see what you mean. No use asking you if you've got a ticket. Scarcely. In a negligee, you can pretty well tell everything I've got. I get a blanket from the hostess. Do you have a ticket? Not that I can find. And you have no idea how or why you're here? No. Well, kind of hazy. But no. No. Damn, if we could only get out of these seat belts. What for? You see that couple sitting down front? The older man and the chick in the jeans? Yeah. I, I, I've got a crazy notion they were already on the plane before it landed. Or anyway, before it picked us up. Maybe they have some answers. What about the mean-looking kid with the frizzy up ahead? One with the knife he's trying to cut the belt with. I don't think I want to tangle with that character. He's riding the edge of something. This is your captain. We have now reached our cruising altitude. And for a brief period, till our next stop, we suggest you loosen your seatbelts if you so desire, and stretch out a little. 
Smoking is permitted in the rear half of the plane. Mr. Moss? Yes, Jenny? What did you mean about me beginning to realize what's happening as well as you do? Aren't you beginning to remember things? I... I'm not sure. It, it's like a bad dream. Things that couldn't really happen have happened to me only... And the worst of all is... I don't know how to say it. How to explain You don't have to, Jenny. I know. I feel the same way. But sooner or later, we're going to have to face it. No. Jenny, my poor, dear little Excuse girl. Excuse me for breaking up the love scene, but I'm looking for a couple of answers, man. There's no smoking in this section of the plane. <laughs> You gotta be putting me on, man. There's five of us here. That's all there are. Who cares? Them other two will lit up. In the proper section. And the lady beside me doesn't smoke. Oh, you mean love child here? Don't let her give you no runaround, Dad. She not only smokes, turns on. But she's a user, I can tell. Put that cigarette out, punk, or I'll run you aft and stick your head down one of the bowls. Tough guy, huh? Still feel so tough? <gasps> a knife? Oh, Mr. Moss! Take it easy, Jenny. I don't think he wants to try to use it. It's just supposed to scare me and try to prove what a big man he is. Hey, now, don't ever kid yourself. I got nothing to lose. Now, let's answer me a couple of questions. Such as? Where's this plane headed for? I don't know. Now, don't give me that. You were here before we got up. Before... Or however we got here, you must know something. Don't you know why you're here? Hey, man, would I be asking you if I did? Hold it. What do you two want? The same thing you do, apparently. Information. Our seat belts. Mr. Moss, we can loosen them Yes, Jenny, I already have. Come on, come on. Let's start cluing us in. What is this, a prison ship or something? And why would you think that? Will you lay out... Hey. Hey, what's the idea to get up your wearing? I don't know. It's what I had on when I woke up here on the plane. You mean you two were shacking up and he brought you aboard in your fancy nightshirt? No, there. she doesn't mean that. The first time I met this lady was on this plane. I, I, I don't even know how I got here myself. And why don't you put that knife away? And why don't you cool it? I ain't letting this out of my hand till I get a slant on what this whole gig is, see? My name is Herbert Moss. This is Ginny Wallace. Who cares about names? We should get acquainted since we're all in the same fix. Well, all right. I'm Danny. Uh, Danny... Uh, da I don't know. Somebody must have slipped me a mickey or something before I got caught it on here. I, I can't think. Uh, Ginny and I had trouble remembering who we were. How about you two? Oh... Uh, a, a kind of a voice whispered my name to me. Yeah, me too. That's how I knew my name. Yeah, yeah, right on, right on. Same with me. Like I was, like, like, like I was coming to. Uh, uh, wake up, Danny. Uh, yeah, yeah. The old bag in the uniform. She said, Schaefer. That's it. Danny Schaefer. Uh, Downing. Uh, Bruce Downing. That's me. And the voice said, Carol Newman. Newman. Oh well, great. Now, now we're all buddies, okay? But look, I'm asking you, Dad, what's going on? What do you know? I told you nothing. Don't give me that. I heard you say something to the love chick here when I came up. Something about face it. Face what? Doesn't anybody know? Or guess? It, it's all just bits and pieces, things that won't go together. I, well, I can't remember it straight. Yeah, I, it's like that for me, too. Mr. Downing? Uh, yeah. That's about the size of it. One thing I do... Uh, it doesn't tie in right away. How about you, Dad? Well, I'm beginning to remember a lot more than I want to. All right, now what does that mean? Now answer me a question first. Do you remember anything? Yeah. I remember plenty. I've held up stores, run numbers, lifted, hoisted cars, you name it, ever since I was 14 years old only to put something in my stomach. The last thing I do remember is I finally went for the big one. Murder one. 
was robbing a store and a, a cop tried to jump me. And before I could think, I... I had the shiv in him and I knew he'd bought it. So that's to clear the air. I don't really care about none of the rest of you. All I want to know is what am I doing in this bleeping plane and where are we headed and how do we get off of here? And this time I expect an answer, Dad. Because I think you know. I don't know exactly. I'm only guessing. For two reasons. Spill them. First, you all heard Danny. He's done plenty to be ashamed of, even if he wouldn't admit it. I think the first part of that statement is what all of us have in common. We're all deeply ashamed of something or things we've done. That's number one. What would I be ashamed of? Or me? I didn't do anything wrong. Shut up! What's the other thing we got in common? Take a look at your windbreaker, Danny. Yeah, what about it? There's a hole in the front. So what? Unzip it. Look at your shirt underneath. Or pull up your shirt and look at your chest. Hey, come on. What are you trying to pull? I'm trying to answer your questions for you. And for all of us. Okay. Okay. I'm all blood. What happened? I'm guessing that police officer you knifed had a partner and that he shot you. Right through the heart. I, I got a hole in my chest. Big slug. At least, at least a 38. If I hit like that, I, I must be... Oh, no. No, no, I can't be. I'm afraid you are, Danny. I'm afraid all of us are. You mean we're, we're dead? This is your captain. Will you please be sure that you are seated and have fastened your seatbelts? Please extinguish all cigarettes. We are coming in for a landing now. Thank you. Better fasten up, everyone. What for? Not me. I'm getting off this plane when it lands, understand? They won't allow you to. You might as well follow orders. If he increases the pitch anymore, you'll be rolling all over the floor. You could break your neck. What difference does it make if I'm dead? I don't know that for sure. I'm only guessing because... Because I think I remember that... I am dead. Herb guessed the truth? And if he has, what are the passengers who ride this strange plane headed for at this next landing? That is, supposing the pilot can pull the plane out of the screaming dive that has sent Dan scrambling for a seat and, for the moment, the welcome restraint of the seat belt. I'll be back in a moment with Act Three. The following fable is presented to make you want to buy a Buick. I've never been very good at making decisions. Fortunately, when I was little, I had some help. He's a boy. We'll take the blue blanket, the blue rattle, and the blue baby buggy with the rubber bumpage. As I grew older, however, I was increasingly on my own. Should I wear my snowsuit or my swimsuit? Gee, that's a toughie. Not today. Decisions still aren't my big strength. May I have your signature, Mr. Seymour? Let me see. Should I use a pencil, a pen, a crayon? I mean, I don't... Well, thanks to Buick, I now have real problems. I mean, having heard what a great engine the V6 is, spunky and efficient and all, and knowing that Buick is famous for V6 engines, well, I trotted right down to a Buick dealer. Then I find out that they offer it in three cars. There's Skyhawk, the compact Skylark, and the midsize Century, <laughs> and all with the Buick V6. Well, it wasn't easy, but I finally decided <laughs> I'll take a Skylark, <laughs> won't I? Buick, dedicated to the free spirit in just about everyone. In certified land, find a helping hand They'll give you service like no one can Your fruits and vegetables are delectables with Raggedy Ann Cause Raggedy Ann means more quality In jar or bottle or can you see Everything tastes just grand with Raggedy Ann for Raggedy Ann Finer Foods at these independent certified stores, Milwaukee Western Mart, Quality Grocery and Market, Taylorville My Store, Paula Central Avenue Food Mart, Piotone Supermarket, 
Lowell Foods, Mattoon My Store, CNL Food Center, and Matino Foods, and they're independent, so they have to serve Tasty you better. Raggedy and certified land. This is WBBM Chicago, and now back to CBS Mystery Theater. Again, the great plane lies earthbound, or at least not in the act of flying. Again, swirling mists mask whatever may lie outside the cabin where five people sit imprisoned now. And again, the motherly but elusive stewardess superintends the boarding of new passengers. This time, only one who is seated in the very rear. And now, with his arrival, there is a new surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Hey, look, I want to talk to you. I want to get off. Please, please help me. I want to get off. Be quiet and listen to me, please. I have something to explain. This will be the last stop before your destination. The passenger who has just come on board is the Reverend Dr. Pell. He will join you as soon as you are airborne. I will not be with you for the rest of the flight. May I wish you all goodbye and good luck. Beloved Father, I do remember that article of the Acts of Religion which does concern the wicked, and such be void of a lively faith. Must I then be denied the partaking of the body of Christ in the use of the Lord's Supper? <gasps> what happened? Nothing. We just stopped climbing and leveled off. Then that means the seatbelt light should be going on any minute, and then, and then the horn will tell us that we can get off and get out of here, right? I suppose so. For all that means. Hey, look, we ain't dead. I ain't buying any of that bull, understand? Now I gotta get to a dock and fix me up. Won't do any good. Too late. How do you know? I mean, what makes you so sure? Because I have a hole in my chest to match yours. Look. Your shirt is covered with blood. <laughs> oh. I had everything. A loving wife, fine children, successful career. I'm 48 years old. And my secretary was 22. And I took advantage of her. Made her my mistress. Promised her a marriage I knew I had no intention of going through with. And I was just leaving her apartment when the young man... She should have married. Emotionally insane. Shot me. The last thing I remember was the bullet tearing into my chest. And then the blackness. That's why I know I am dead. And why I am on this plane. Why all of us are. Why? Why me? He said it before. We all have something to be ashamed of. What was your scene, man? Mention anything an actor can do to claw his way to the top, and I've tried it. I... I won't embarrass little Jenny by naming him. I wouldn't want to hurt a lady's feelings. I once thought I had talent as a designer. But I had another talent that men were more interested in. It was with quite a lot of money, I found was after I'd been married and my husband walked out on me when, when I had a kid. I'm not excusing myself. But I did have to bring up my baby until she died. And by that time, as you can see, I wasn't all that young anymore. So, so much in demand. And what was there left to live for? I had uppers, downers, everything. So... Instead of my usual two before going to bed alone, I emptied the bottle. <laughs> Excuse the hearts and flowers. But it seems to be let's take our hair down time. But I thought you'd broken out of the trap. I had. At the expense of my best friend. 
Yeah, who? An actor friend who was playing the part in Uranus. Who got me the job as understudy. His first break, too. I slipped him a Mickey before the opening night performance. That's how I went on and got all the reviews. <laughs> I thought I was a big star already, had it made. Bought myself a sports job and became a party boy. Invited now instead of hired. I turned that car upside down trying to make a right angle curve at 90. Damn right I'm dead, and I know it. And maybe I'm glad. I... I killed my baby. I deserve to die. Hush, Jenny. Jenny, hush. I love in that bed. I loved him so. I wanted to be married. But Mom wouldn't give her consent. She thought he was too old for me. I thought if, if I was having his baby, Mom would have to agree about marriage. I waited till after three months. And I told her. Only he walked out on me. And it, it was too late. Too late for the hospitals to take care of me. So I, I didn't want his baby anymore. And I went to not even a doctor. Oh. It was murder. I deserve to die. We all do. And Mr. Moss is right. That's why we're here. And that's where we're all going. Straight to hell. Oh, no. No, sir, not me. Now, what do you think you're going to do? I've been looking. The door to the cockpit is open. The ship's enough. I'm going in there and skyjack this plane. I'm going to make that pilot turn back. The belts are open. Come on, Bruce. We better get him. What, do you think there's a chance? I don't want that crazy kid to... What is it, Danny? Danny, what's the matter? There's no one in there. No one. There's no one flying the plane. Good Lord. I'm afraid not, Miss Newman. Not yours or any of ours. What do you mean, Father? I'm not a father. But you're still a minister. You could help us. I wish I could, my dear. I wish that with all my heart, but... You see, I am one of you. I've been listening to all of you, and I know now that's why I'm here. I no longer have any right to the name of a minister. What brought you here to join us, sir? The greatest sin of all. I renounced my God. I spent the last four years in Vietnam. I saw such suffering and misery without reason that... Ah. But I was too busy then to think of the scars it left on the mind. I was only returning to the United States, wanting to pray for those poor people I'd known and for the agony of our country and all the world that... that suddenly I found there were no more words. There was no more belief. Everything had been wrung from me. And my faith was gone. How did you die? By God's hand. I was passing a crowd, lost in my own thoughts and the struggle in my mind. And a policeman came to me and said there was a boy on a ledge, threatening to kill himself unless they found him a minister. I went up to that high place and out on that ledge, and I asked him to come in. And he said to me, Father, why should I come back to a world where there is no God? Tell me, convince me that there is one, and I will come in. Where were the words of comfort that can only be spoken from the soul? I, who had picked this mission to devote my life to, had none to offer. And the blackness hit me. 
I felt myself reeling, and like Lucifer, I fell headlong into eternal damnation. I wonder whose is the greatest sin. And does it matter after all? I'd guess that religion has touched me less than any one of you. But I still have hope. Hey, man, what are you talking about? You're the one put the whammy on us from the beginning. You're the one first put us all behind the eight ball. Whatever all of us did, we were human. Human, born to make mistakes. Big or little. If we didn't, we'd be God. Or gods. Each of us carries our private hell within us. I cannot conceive of anything beyond that as punishment. The whole idea of God surely means compassion. What's that? We're landing. Without any approach? In midair? What does it mean? Hey, help me. Hey, knock it off, Danny. Hey, ain't you scared? Sure. But not so much after what Mr. Moss said. Flynn's coming to a halt. Ruth, you said we were two of a kind. Yeah. Then can I hang on to you? I'm terrified. Sit down, everyone. Let's not waste time. Who are you? Traffic control, of course. Are we in hell? Not yet. May I ask where we are? This is sort of a halfway station. We have your dossiers. You have all made mistakes of greater or lesser value. That's neither here nor there. You have reached what is usually called the point of no return. That is the point on a journey where you are exactly halfway. And so you have a choice. Do you wish to continue? Or would you like to go back to where you were before the moment of finite death? You mean we are not condemned everlastingly? No one has judged you as yet but yourselves. None of you returns to face an easy life. But if you want to, you may. You mean there is a God who offers us a second chance? Of course. Everyone deserves that, don't you think? if the memory of this tale will haunt you. And if, perhaps, as it does, that mistake, that hurtful or even vicious action you may have taken may give you a moment's pause to reconsider and perhaps to try to repair the damage. For all of us, there is a second chance. At least once. I'll be back shortly. everybody. This is Cousin Bruce Morrow for the Foundation Church. Now, these are troubled times. Not a lot of money around. Work's kind of tough to get. Apathy's here. We're disillusioned. Wondering what, what's going to go down next. Well, it's easy to go along with it, right? I mean, just sit around and say, huh, who cares? You don't have the next guy worry about it. But does it have to be like this? Pride, dignity, truth. Being straight with one another. Now, these qualities have not disappeared. They've just gone to sleep for a while, right? But now's the time to wake them up. Only we can do it. This message is brought to you by the Foundation Church, 111 East 38th Street, New York, New York. Zip 10016. A girl named Ginny Wallace had a fine baby girl. Carol Newman works in a center for retarded children. Bruce Newman is a successful star. Danny is serving a sentence for robbery, but is soon to be paroled. The Reverend Morgan Pell has gone back to Vietnam. We have no record of what happened to him there. And Herb Ross broke off his relationship with Barbara, who returned to her old love, while Herb wisely never troubled his wife or children with his own indiscretion. It is enough that he suffers with it in his conscience. 
Our cast included Richard Crenna, Janet Waldo, Casey Kasem, Virginia Gregg, and Sam Edwards. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. No wonder the police were at Mrs. Fern Glass's yesterday. Oh, poor old thing. If she had only been taking the pan pharmacon. Uh, she took too much. Now, his, his witch hunt is on. I may have to get rid of all the bottles I filled. But why, dear? We're not doing any wrong. Yeah, we know that. But the rest of, of them, they, outside, the unbelievers, they want to persecute us. But how can they find us? Nobody in the coven will come forward. No, but Kathy might. It's a chance we can't afford to take. She's got to disappear. Oh, Oh, do we have to, Jason, darling? She doesn't have to see the paper. It's on every newsstand with that big headline. How can she miss it? Well, we'll just have to keep her home. Uh, it's dangerous. I'd have to be sure there was some way she'd never get wind of this story. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm Tammy Grimes. When death and murder become an everyday occurrence, it is generally labeled war. When brother kills brother on the battlefield, it is the most pyrrhic of victories. Nobody wins, everyone loses. And it is in such times that cowards and heroes abound. We will meet both today, and knaves and cheats, and some American history we're not too proud of. Willie, get me out of here. I can't face that man. He betrayed 1,500 of us. His orders killed us. You've got to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you accuse the general of a despicable act, of sacrificing 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Cal, you hold the rank of major in the Union Army. Talk to your former commanding officer. Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. Our drama, The Ghost of Andersonville, was adapted from an actual account of the Civil War. 
especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by Cat's Paw, Heels and Souls. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Gallery of Homes Brokers show you more than houses. They show you financing. With dozens of finance plans to choose from, your gallery broker will show you a way to afford that dream home today. Coast to coast, gallery brokers show you what you ask for in a home and what you can afford in a payment plan. I'll be, I'll to talk to you your local independently owned and operated Gallery of Homes office today. Pause for a moment and listen to your shoes. They may need to be cat's pod. Hey, stop! What do you think you're doing? We just need heels and souls. How could you throw us out in the street when we've been so good to you and your feet? New shoe prices out of sight. Look for the sign of the cat and make your tried and true shoes as good as new shoes. With Cat's Paw Heels and Soles. Take us to the shop, come on and get a cat pod. Say, did you know thousands of people from the South and Southwest suburbs have been making extra money using the Daily Southtown Economist? How? By running Daily Southtown Super Saver Want Ads to sell cars, household items, and lots more. Whether it's furniture, garage sales, yard sales, or boat sales, Super Saver Ads will bring you fast results. And they're easy as four, five, six. You get four lines for five dollars for six days. Your ad reaches 42 Southtown communities, places like Oak Lawn, Orland Park, Homewood, Lansing, and Tinley Park. Over a half million readers. Super Saver Want Ads really get the job done, and they're easy to place. Just dial 586-8800 and ask for a Super Saver ad taker. Call before 5 p.m. today, and your ad will run tomorrow. It's that simple. Daily Southtown Super Saver Want Ads are limited to private parties in merchandise and auto classifications. Just call 586-8800, and you can start making Super Saver money tomorrow. Civil War. The Confederacy is about to collapse. Re-elected Abraham Lincoln is loved and hated, and Washington bigwigs are looking towards who will be the next president. They are looking to someone from the army, perhaps a general. For that they need heroes, not always easy to come by. General Cutler, have you heard the latest? Can't say I have, my boy. But you men with the Secret Service, you seem to know all the Washington scuttlebutt. I was in Bill Wood's office. We were getting our assignments. Uh, so many for counterfeit detection, so many detailed to protect Lincoln and Stanton and so on. And then Wood said, they tell me Cutler's the man. I'm the man for what? The party is picking you to follow Lincoln. That's the thinking. The thinking of nominating me when Lincoln's term runs out? Well, that's the talk. Well, what makes them think Lincoln won't ask for a third term? He might. Then again, he might not. Well, who would I be running against? Grant. Grant? Oh, I wouldn't stand much of a chance. He's got command of all the Union armies. General, I think the people would prefer a Cutler in the White House and a Grant in the barracks. Nicely said, Forrest. But do the people even know who I am? Word will get around. You've already earned your stars, sir. No one has forgotten Fredericksburg or your gallant attack on Chattanooga, sir. Well, that was some time ago. And that you are the acknowledged hero of the prisoner exchange plan. It's not only who wins the war and pray the Lord Grant will defeat the rebels, but it's who looks after our boys. Tim, if you put it that way, I'd say I might have a chance. I hope when Bill Wood was making these Secret Service assignments, he intended to keep you at my side. You have given me excellent protection since I came out of the hospital, and it appears you have a political mind as well. I'd like to know I can count on you. An honor, General Cutler. I hope to continue to serve you. Timothy, 
I think I'll ride down to Burnside and surprise Mrs. Cutler with the news. Benjamin, that is the most exciting thing I have ever heard. You should be very proud. Well, I am a little pleased. However, we're a considerable distance from the White House. If the election were held tomorrow, I'm afraid most voters would say, Benjamin Cutler who? I shall have to drum up some ideas to bring me to the attention of the public. What about that prisoner of war who is leaving Richmond for Washington? What about him? Isn't he the last prisoner of war to be returned to us from Andersonville? Yes, but I don't see what... Doesn't it occur to you that this could be a story that would make all of America sit up and take notice? I don't quite see how. If we arrange to have all the newspapers here the day the prisoner arrives... Now? Now do you see? You mean I welcome him here at Burnside? Benjamin, it is you who have organized the exchange of prisoners. Those rebels we hold here for our brave Union men in Andersonville. Finally, the last prisoner returns home. If you welcome that man, bring him into our home, you become a symbol of the kind of leadership we all look to. Mary, I like that. I like that. (laughs) Well, I'd better get cracking on the idea. I'll talk it over with Tim Forrest. Oh, I'm glad he's still assigned to you. He's so faithful. And quite clever. He's just the one to make the high-level arrangements with Stanton. Stanton? The Secretary of War. He can fix it up to have the man welcomed here in our own home. I wonder if he could get the army band to play on the law. Oh, I can just see it. Major, uh, what's his name? Calvin Russell. Major Russell arrives on the noon train. He's probably accompanied by Red Cross nurses. Is he married? No, no, he's not. Oh, good. You and I are at the station. We whisk him in our carriage here to Burnside. The band strikes up the star-spangled banner. Reporters from newspapers all over the world are here. Oh, Benjamin, can't you just see it? You must make a marvelous welcoming speech. You might even have some photographs taken. Oh, it's going to be so exciting. The event of the century. Reporters, please don't crowd the observation platform of the train. Him, when's he coming out? The train's been here for ten minutes. Where is he? General, you know the major's lane. I don't know which car he's in. It'll take him a little time to get out here. I mean, there's such a thing as a schedule. Here, we've got a carriage waiting and an army of reporters and photographers hanging around at home on the lawn. That Calvin Russell was always unreliable. Oh, I didn't know you knew the major personally. He was in my outfit, got captured in the Chattanooga raid, and shipped off to Andersonville. Oh, Forrest, send word back into the coach. I want the major out here in three minutes, not one second more. Yes, sir. going out there. Major Russell, everyone has come a very long way to welcome you home. You are taking this ceremony all the wrong way. Am I? Now, what about your friends? You must have friends out there in the station. Some of my friends drowned in the Mississippi. Those who didn't swam with me to shore and were shot as they swam. The rest, the few who escaped, died in the prison at Andersonville. Nurse Wilson, today I'm alone. I have no friends left. Well, I guess I was wrong, Major. I thought you agreed to be greeted by General Cutler because you wanted to honor all the men who died during the war and wanted to speak for them. But I guess I was mistaken. Well, I... Maybe I hadn't thought of that. Now, there's going to be a reception. Secretary of War Stanton himself is supposed to be there. They'll want you to speak. Do you suppose I could meet President Lincoln? Of course you can, and you will, I'm sure. General Cutler has it all arranged. Cutler, that... That what? Never mind. Is he still out there? I'm sure he is. He arranged all this for you, Major. Nurse Wilson, you go out to the observation platform and you tell whoever's in charge that if Cutler will go away, I'll come out. 
I don't want to be in the same state as that man. Uh, go, go see who that is, will you? I don't want anyone to come into this compartment. I'll duck into the laboratory. Go on. Yes? Oh, nurse. I'm Tim Forrest, Secret Service. General Cutler asked me when the major would be making an appearance. Now, we're a little late and a little tight on the schedule. Is he all right? Oh, yes, he's fine. Uh, tell everyone he'll be out directly. Oh, thank you, nurse. I heard all of that. Why didn't you tell him? Go on, you go on out there and tell him what I told you. Cutler leaves, Russell arrives. Won't you change your mind? I don't wish to have anything to do with the general. He can stay if he wants to, but I'll not see him. Hand me my crutch, please. I'll be waiting right here when you come back. Major, they won't understand. No one has any idea that That's you... That's exactly it. No one has any idea what kind of a man he is. But I know. And the dead know. I haven't been in a hell on earth all these months to be welcomed by a man who doesn't deserve his stars. I hate him. I saw him from the window, alive and fat. Well, I'll do what I can. I cannot tell them what you want me to. I'll have to think of something else. General, some of us have been waiting since six this morning. Do you know for a fact that the Major is on the train? Yes, of course I know it for a fact. The man could be ill. Anything. Uh, General Cutler, may I talk to you? Forrest, this is ridiculous. Fifteen minutes we've been waiting. What is it? Is Russell sick? Why the delay? I look like an idiot standing up here on the observation platform all by myself trying to answer reporters. Uh, there appears to be a slight problem. So what is it? His nurse is on the way out and she wants to tell you herself. Uh, what is all the mystery? There's General Cutler here. I'd like a word with him. What is it, nurse? Where's the major? I'm General Cutler. Is he coming out soon? I'm afraid not. Uh, the major sent his regrets, but he is... Uh... A little shy, I'm afraid. Shy? All we want him to do is come out here, shake my hand, we take a few pictures. I make a speech, and we whisk him off to my farm. General, what happened was, as soon as the train pulled into the platform, he... Well, he started getting very nervous. You do understand, he's been a prisoner for well over two years. Almost everyone he knew died in prison. What's your name? Nurse Wilson. Nurse Wilson, you go back to him on the double. Tell the Major we honor him and wait for him to make an appearance. Tell him I personally am waiting for him. It won't make any difference, General. No difference? Does he know I'm here? Yes, he's been watching you from the window. You mean he can see me now? He just said to send his regrets... But right now, he doesn't feel like leaving the train. General, may I see what I can do? Please give me a moment. Nurse Wilson, if you'd lead the way, I'll have a talk with the Major. He's coming out! Here he comes! General Cutler, allow me to place the Major by your side. Calvin Russell. <laughs> good to see you. So good! My old buddy, I have to make a speech first. Uh, Forrest, uh, will you make an introduction, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen of the press, guests, General Benjamin Cutler would like to say a few words to welcome Major Calvin Russell, the last of the Union prisoners to be released from Andersonville. <clears throat> Major Russell, gentlemen of the Fourth Estate, Citizens of this great country, from Pennsylvania Avenue to the length and breadth of this vast, great country, our hearts go out to the men who so gallantly fought and gave their lives so that this nation under God... And that is why we are honored to welcome from the bottom of our grateful hearts this hero of heroes, Major Calvin Russell. 
May we have a picture of you, General Cutler, uh, shaking hands with a major? Excuse me, uh, Nurse Wilson. Will you take me back to my compartment, please? But the picture, uh, what is this? Forrest, Forrest, do something. He turned his back on me and walked out. Forrest, do something. <laughs> beginning to a ceremony which General Cutler hoped would solidify his political career. What is it that makes Major Russell turn away from his old commander in the field? At this point, one can only guess it is of such magnitude that the former prisoner of war risks a reprimand or even a court-martial. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Now you can make dependable household help appear out of thin air when you buy a Campbell Hausfeld air compressor from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you with the one-half horsepower compressor and optional spray kit, you can turn thin air into a powerful force that will spray paint and insecticides, inflate tires and toys, clean screens or operate portable air tools, or choose from the larger models and other optional accessory kits from the wide selection available at participating True Value Hardware Stores and home centers. Okay, roll the TV spot. We open on the Great Pyramid in downtown Dayton. Dayton? We moved it there for this commercial, Mr. Fenortner. Looks so expensive. Suddenly, an elephant enters with a man on top. Uh, He's holding a can of Fenortner tuna. Why an elephant? A tuna with a jumbo taste. Oh. Uh, Fade to black. Why couldn't you use radio? Cost less, targets the right audience than it sells. How could we show the Pyramid, Dayton, and the elephant on radio? You just did. Radio. Red hot because it works. For more facts on radio, call this station of the Radio Advertising Bureau. They Get a piece of paper and a pencil. Here's some important news from the Gallant Men of Olds. The monthly cost of buying a new Oldsmobile just went down. Put yourself in an 82 Cutlass Sierra for $175 a month. You got that pencil? Here goes. If you own a 1976 Cutlass Supreme with a value of $2,250 based on the March 15th Illinois Black Book official used car market guide and trade it in on an 82 Cutlass Sierra with air conditioning at a discounted price of $87.95 based on an independent survey, your balance of payment will be $65.45. With GMAC 12.8 annual percentage rate financing for 48 months, your low monthly payment will be $175. Deferred total payment, $8,400. Sales tax, license, and title fees additional. You got all that? Then get to your gallant men of olds. They've got the best deal on every 82 Oldsmobile. Visit your gallant man today and get the new olds you want at a monthly payment you can afford. Hurry, you must take delivery by May 31st. Only $175 a month. Benjamin Cutler seeks a political opportunity which might make his name better known. To further that desire, he has arranged for the last prisoner of war to be released from the infamous Andersonville prison and arrive for a ceremonial welcome. Only the Major isn't buying. He will not cooperate. Have they left the railroad station yet, Nurse Wilson? They are leaving now. Major, what are you going to do? Sit here in the compartment until the whole party is gone? The only person I don't wish to lay eyes on is Cutler. When he goes, I'll come out. But there is a reception planned at his house. The Secret Service agent told me the Secretary of War plans to be there. Now, you're not going to insult him, are you? Mm -hmm. You think there's something wrong with me, don't you? One doesn't have to be very clever to realize something happened between you two during the war. And that you haven't forgiven him. No, I haven't. Major Russell, the general has left. May I say a word to you? Shall I leave? No, of course not. Come in, Forrest. I guess uh, I owe you an explanation. You don't owe it to me. Well, I don't know Cutler or anything either. 
What are we going to do now? Mrs. Cutler is at their home and everything is laid on. A message will be read to you from President Lincoln. Even the Marine Band is there. I don't mind all that. It's Cutler himself. Well, then you're in luck. The general had to return to the capital. Everything ran so late, he won't be going with you to his farm. Well, I'll go to the reception. I'll meet his wife, sure. Anything, so long as I don't have to shake his hand or talk to him. Major, it's all in your honor. Everyone who is here today honors you. I'm sorry my husband had to go back to Washington, but he has a great deal to attend to. We uh, saw each other on the platform of the last car of the train. I wonder if I could speak to you for a moment. Oh, certainly, Timothy. Uh, Major, will you excuse us? I shall be right back and give you a first-hand tour of our little farm. Don't let any of the reporters intimidate you. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Cutler. I, I won't. Mrs. Cutler, we have a problem with the Major. I didn't have time to explain to you why we arrived from the railroad station so late, but he refused to come out on the observation platform for the general's welcome. Refused? He finally did. It took a lot of persuading. There's been some experience the major and the general shared at Chattanooga, and the major still holds some kind of a grudge. Could you, Mrs. Cutler, somehow get the major to agree to talk to the reporters, at least to one of them? Well, of course he will. I'll make him. After all, the whole purpose of having him arrive here in the first place is so that we could generate some publicity to help the general's political image. Now, if we could only get the major to acknowledge his indebtedness and all of those freed from Andersonville, indebted to the general, well, you can imagine how the public would react. You are talking to the one person who could not agree with you more, Timothy. Well, here we are back. Mr. Forrest, I think that's a wonderful idea, and I suggest you pick up whoever you think will do the best job and have them down by the lily pond. I'll do that. Thank you very much. Now, Major, did my husband tell you of his infatuation with growing water lilies? No, ma'am. No, we never got round to talking about that. Well, he's mad for them. You wouldn't think so, a big burly soldier like him. And now we shall tour Burnside. We named our farm after the Major General himself. Oh. Well, he'd be pleased, ma'am. Yes, over a thousand acres of good farming land. Well, he'd like that. I want to show you the lily pond. It's uh, quite a little distance down this path. Uh, you don't mind that? Uh, walking with the cane, I mean. Mrs. Cutler, with this cane, I've walked to Hades and back. And I intend to keep on walking. I would like to see all the sights on the general's farm. You just show me the way. I'll follow. <laughs> Isn't that the most beautiful lily pond you ever saw? They're not all water lilies, you know. That one's a floating heart. And all around the edge, those big leaves, elephant ears. And there's a water hyacinth. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh, may I introduce myself? Wilbur May of the New York Weekly News. Well, how do you do? Uh, Tim Forrest said the uh, major might be ready to be interviewed. I think so. I hope you agree, Major Russell. You know, there are 150 reporters from up north covering the war, and for me to get first crack at interviewing Calvin is a great piece of luck. Right, Cal? You and the Major know one another? Well, Calvin and I are cousins. We're uh, real proud of you at home, Cal. Well, that's splendid. I think I can safely leave you two alone. Oh, uh, there's only one thing I'll ask of you, Mr. May, and that is... I'd like your readers to know it was General Benjamin Cutler who was responsible for getting so many of our boys out of Andersonville. Uh, certainly. I hope it all goes well. Well, uh, how do you feel, Cal? Did you hear what she said about Cussed Cutler getting our men out of Andersonville? Uh-huh. If it weren't for him, there wouldn't have been so many Union boys in Andersonville. Oh, is that so? Well, this is some celebration I got going for you. No, it don't fool me, Willie. Cutler never did anything for anyone but himself. Huh. If it 
If it hadn't have been for Cutler, we'd never have been in that prison. We were betrayed. That's the real story. Betrayed by who? Will you print it if I tell you? <laughs> now, come on. What a question to ask. An exclusive with a top-ranking former prisoner of war? Why wouldn't I? Now, for one thing, it knocks the stuffing out of your big Washington hero. General Cutler? Hmm. Take the load off your feet, Willie, and thank the Lord you got the use of both of them. You know I have to go into a hospital for a wooden leg? Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Were you tortured at Andersonville? Yes, but that's not how I lost my leg. I'll tell you how. Where do you want me to begin? Well, Cal, it was your war. You tell it. It was November, back in 63. Longstreet had pushed us with our backs to Chattanooga. Bragg did nothing. He just sat there, thinking he could starve out the rebels. We were upriver. And uh, then Cutler got the bright idea to build rafts and float the troops past the enemy and gain a foothold on the southern bank. Williams... How many rafts are ready now? Only enough for about 500 troops, sir. Why are they so slow? I've got to move 2,500 men before dawn. The men are doing the best they can, sir. Russell! Kill Russell! Has anyone seen Major Russell? General Cutler, yes, sir. What is it, General? Williams tells me the rafts won't be finished before tomorrow night. So we wait. I'm sure Williams could supply enough rafts tonight for 1,000 troops. What are you thinking? Well, we send two contingents. One tonight of 1,000 men, and one tomorrow of 1,500. If the 1,000 men get through tonight, the Johnny Rebs on Lookout Mountain aren't going to be caught napping tomorrow night. <laughs> Up there on Lookout Mountain. Tomorrow, that'll be your responsibility, Cal. With the 1,500 men. I have every confidence you'll make it. Floating downstream, armed with just our rifles. They'll be waiting for us, and they'll cut us into small pieces. Major, it's an order. And that's just what the rebels did. We never got as far as the southern bank. Of the 1,500 with me on the chained rafts, a 1,000 were blown out of the water. 500 were shot as they tried to swim to shore, and the rest of us were rounded up and taken to Andersonville. It was in that action that my leg got shot up. Well, that's never been told. There was only one man to blame, Will, and that's Cutler. He was responsible. When you're locked up and you see 500 men dying of scurvy, no food worth eating, mush for days, weeks, months... I understood it was pretty fierce. You don't know the half of it, Will. My men, the best men in the world, dead and dying all around me. Because one man gives an order against all common logic and common sense, he orders 1,500 floating sitting ducks to their death. Yeah, I... I can't tell you how horrified and sorry I am. Sending men down the Mississippi like that in two groups may have been a tactical error. It happens in war, Cal. Yeah, but it shouldn't. I told him not to. We had one chance to make it, not two. Sure, the first rafts got through, but the next night they were waiting for us. But do you hold Cutler responsible for conditions in Andersonville? I do. For those who died there because of him, you bet I do. And he has the nerve, the gall, to ask me to be his standard bearer for his political career. I almost exploded when I heard that. All right. I'll write it, Cal. Is there any more you'd like to add? Just more of the same, Willie. Betrayal and hell. I don't like to interrupt you, gentlemen, but I have wonderful news. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh... The Major has given me all I need. The General has returned. He's here. Isn't that marvelous? Mr. Forrest is just bringing him down. I'm going up the path to meet them. Willie, get me out of here. What am I going to do? You are going to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you are, accusing the General of a despicable act, of sacrificing needlessly 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Only you are telling me. Cal... You're a major in the Union Army. Talk to the general. 
Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. Here I am again, Major. <laughs> Sorry I had to get off to the capital of our great nation, but business before pleasure any time. Uh, Benjamin, this is Mr. Wilbur May. He's with the New York Weekly News. Oh, an excellent newspaper. I'd be glad to make a statement. Uh, no, Benjamin, not now. You two men will feel more at ease if I take Mr. May off with me. Uh, please, sir, do come along. All right. We'll leave you both alone. Mr. May, may I take your arm? Willie, I'll talk to you later. Calvin, I'm sorry. The way it turned out. Deeply sorry. You scum. You never once admitted you gave that order that killed so many of us. Admitted it? How? How? Publicly. I knew you didn't. I had a nurse who came down especially from Washington. She didn't know a thing about Chattanooga. Said no one did. It was unforgivable. I've never forgiven myself either, Calvin. But that was two years ago. Why bring it up now? I see them all floating down the Mississippi that night. Fifteen hundred of us. And the gunfire and the screaming... Have you ever heard hundreds of men screaming in agony at the same time? Hundreds diving and falling into the water. Hundreds more gasping and drowning. The river red with their blood. All dead. All but a handful. And myself ending up to die by inches in Andersonville. Because cursed Cutler railroaded us to that death. Don't tell me you had no way of knowing. You were the general. I was only a major. I warned you what would happen. Calvin, you're getting yourself all het up. Did you honestly think I would come out of a rebel prison to praise you so that you could hold some political office? Suppose you got elected. What would you do under fire to the American people? Sell them down the river to die? What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. I told you how sorry I was. I have nightmares about it still. But life must go on. Why must it go on, Ben? Why must it go on for you? What, uh, what are you going to do with that gun? Not for you, life won't go on. Join the others who died in the river and in prison. <laughs> Its sound echoes not only across the general's farm near Washington, but across the entire country. The bullet misses its mark. It grazes but does not wound the general. But there is a gaping wound in his reputation, which will never heal. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Dinner's done, the day is ended. Peace and quiet have descended. Now it's just the two of you and you, Maxwell House. Pour a cup, enjoy the flavor, talk about what's new. Spend the precious time together, Maxwell House. You get that good, less up here with Maxwell. This is WBBM Chicago. Announcing the Chicago opening of the largest and greatest furniture store in the Midwest. Homemakers. Not low price furniture. Homemakers. Good furniture at low prices. Homemakers. Homemakers.
Acres, the great showroom warehouse affiliate of John M. Smith, is open now on North Avenue. Northsiders, no more trips to the suburbs for those great furniture bargains, because now it's all right here on Chicago's North Side. Acres of famous name furniture, so you're sure to find exactly what you want. Plus, instead of waiting weeks for your furniture, you can have it in minutes. So come to the new homemakers, halfway between the Kennedy and Lakeshore Drive on North Avenue. You'll save time and you'll save money, because there's no place like Homemakers. The new Homemakers. Homemakers. On Chicago's North Avenue. Homemakers. Honoring Visa and Master Charge. easy to arrest a war hero for attempted murder, and General Cutler won't permit it. In the scuffle, he pockets the Major's gun and quickly retires to his room. Secret Service agent Timothy Forrest tries to spread the story that what happened was an accident, a service revolver discharging unintentionally. But fear is in the air, and the night is churned by thunder, lightning, and rain. Then it is morning. Is that you, Forrest? Uh, Tim Forrest? Wilbur. Oh, I'm not too pleased to see you. Have you seen the general? He grabbed that gun of Cal Russell so fast and disappeared, I, I haven't had a chance to get his side of the story. What they said to each other, how it happened, you know. Oh, I told you it went off accidentally. Tim, I didn't believe that. Have you seen General Cutler? Well, Mrs. Cutler said he may be walking the ground. He isn't. I've searched every inch of the place, up at five to do it. I want to get to the general before every other reporter in the country shows up. Now, you know where he is. That's your job. Are you sure he's not out there? A thousand acres? He'll show up. Tim, I've got a press deadline. Why don't we try his room, just, just in case? Well, I suppose he could have returned and gone upstairs a back way so he wouldn't be seen. Hiding from the press. <laughs> All right, I'll follow you. Uh, no, 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 I can find it alone. Uh, no, you don't. If you interview the general... I am going to be there. General? General Cutler? You think he went back to bed? General Cutler, are you in there? Oh, try the door. It's unlocked. So let's go in. Oh, there he is, with his back to us, sitting at his desk. General, I'm sorry to disturb you. I hope you don't mind my barging in like this, but... Wilbur May here wanted to get a statement. Good Lord. He fainted. He fell forward. F forced. What's the matter? Oh, it's his blood. Look on the desk. He's, oh. he's been shot. And he just keeled over. Oh, Lord in heaven. Uh, uh, I'll get the. No, someone. no, it's too late. He's dead. The general's dead. How can that be? He's been dead a couple of hours sitting like that with a bullet hole in his head, uh, leaning back in his armchair and then falling onto his desk. Forrest, uh... F Forrest, I, I have to write this. All of it. Those powder burns on his temple. He's been shot at close range. Very close. Hmm. Someone he knew. Someone he let come right up to him. Tim, maybe it wasn't murder. Maybe it was suicide. A shame, you know, what the major accused him of. No, uh, no, it couldn't have been suicide. Well, what are you looking for? For the two missing things that might... Might, I said, make me think suicide. But they're not here. Two things are missing? Or do you see a farewell note? Any note? A word to his wife? A written explanation why he killed himself? And the other missing item... Even more important, if the general shot himself, where's the gun? You're right. Where's the gun? It was murder, and the murderer took it with him. I'll bet a year's wages when they examine the bullet, they'll find it was fired from the major's gun. What are you going to do about Cal Russell? What can I do but place him under arrest? He's the prime suspect. I don't look forward to the next two steps. Oh? What's that? Placing the major under arrest 
and then finding Mrs. Cutler and breaking the terrible news to her. But I didn't kill him. Major, you'll have to do more than merely say so. A great many witnesses saw you take the shot at him. Yes, that was yesterday. I know that I must have been out of my mind to do it. I know that. To hate a man is one thing, but to be a judge, jury, and executioner is another. Besides, uh, you say there's no gun. Yes, that's a consideration at this moment, but whoever shot the general could have thrown the gun in any of a hundred places, but it will be found. And make no mistake about that. Hasn't it occurred to the Secret Service, Mr. Forrest, that since I was sleeping way off in the servant's wing, if during the night I'd hobbled with my crutch all the way to the general's room, and I still don't know where that is, isn't it likely in all that time from my room to his and back someone would have seen me? Someone probably did. But right now they're not coming forward. Maybe they hated the general also. And you did their job for them. Uh, on one foot and one crutch. You believe that? I believe a man of your will, who can survive death and imprisonment, can do almost anything he wants to, Major. So my word means nothing to you. What are you going to do? I've sent for some irons for your hands and feet. You're going to put irons on one crutch and my one good foot? You knew he was dead before I saw you, Mrs. Cutler. My maid came and told me, Timothy. You're a very brave woman. You become very acquainted with death when you're married to a soldier. Let's keep walking, Timothy. Mrs. Cutler... Are you sure you feel like walking the grounds just now? I feel if I don't keep moving, I shall die. All of us in Washington love the general. He'll be missed. Yes, all of us. We'll miss him. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, I promise you. It's the last thing I do. I can't tell you how desperate I feel over this tragedy. When I was assigned to the general, it was such an honor... The department trusted me to protect him. Timothy, don't blame yourself. Now, who else is there to blame? What has Major Russell said? Well, he denies everything. Says he was asleep. Isn't that possible? How can he prove it, Mrs. Cutler? What angers me as much as shames me is the story the Major gave as reason for his hatred for your husband. The more I go over it in my mind, sending rafts with 1,500 men, knowing the rebels must be lying in wait, the more I realize it's a wicked, wicked lie. No, Timothy. It wasn't. Calvin Russell's story of what happened was not a lie. It was the truth? Yes. Every word. Mr. Forrest, how long am I going to be kept under restraint? I've sent for the Attorney General. He'll decide. Did you grant me my request? Yes, I did. Oh, that must be her. Come in, Mrs. Cutler. What? What have you done to him? He's in irons, Mrs. Cutler. Oh, no, that is horrible. It's horrible. Timothy, you must undo those irons immediately. I'm sorry, but I cannot. I must wait for the Attorney General and the Prosecutor of the Military Court. We are treating him worse than the Southerners did in Andersonville. No one was hobbled like this. I can't bear it. I won't have it. I'm truly sorry, Mrs. Cutler, but the Major is the only suspect we have at the moment. I can't have a human being treated this way. Major... I'm going to take steps this very moment so that these terrible things are removed and you are set free. Well, how do you aim to do that? I'm going to show you who killed my husband. You know that? I have known it since the night he died. It's there, Timothy. There at the bottom of Benjamin's lily pond. If you take a stick and move some of those water lilies, I'm sure you'll see it. What will I see? The gun that killed him. 
You saw the murderer throw it down there? I threw the gun into the pond. Yes, it's so. That night, in spite of the thunder, I... I heard the shot. I ran to his room. He had killed himself. On the desk was a note. It's down there also. I threw it into the pond. What did it say? That he knew he gave the wrong command. And since that day, he had been haunted by every death of every man. He couldn't live any longer with the shame of it. And asked me to forgive him. What could I do? I wanted so, even in death, to protect Benjamin. It never occurred to me the Major might be accused of his death, so I took what Ben had written and pulled the pistol from his hand and threw them down there in the lily pond. So now, will you remove the irons from that brave man? tarnished piece of Americana is a tale of the brave and the mistakes and tragedies that followed. Here at the Mystery Theater, we have condensed many of the events as well as changed the names of the actual participants. Otherwise, it is what it is, a rather battered and torn page of American history. I shall return shortly. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. This is E.G. Marshall. The doors of the mind can be opened into corridors of unlimited possibilities, where time and place have a way of melding into strange and provocative patterns. Most ghost stories take place in the dark of night, or when shadows are long, and the moon is crossed by clouds. But we're about to meet a ghost at high noon on a blistering hot day without a shadow in the sky. In the course of our story, the two women who are embarked upon a fateful journey find respite from the merciless sun when they are drawn toward a barn from which comes a very human sound. So dank and musty. What a place for a baby. The sound comes from... from there. No, no, the sound comes from over here. We're here. The sound is right here. Yes, and this is a crib. But, but Marion, I know. I know there's no baby in it. Our mystery drama, Ghost at High Noon, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our 
our story begins on a long, straight ribbon of highway in an arid section of the western United States. Marion Jeffries and Janet Marston are longtime friends who are returning home after having driven Marion's son to a summer camp. What a lonely stretch of road. I don't like it. Oh, come on, Marion. No road is lonely at 10 o'clock in the morning. This one is. George was right when he said we should make this part of the trip either very early or late at night. Well, neither of us ever gets up at dawn. <laughs> and I don't think two women should travel the highways after dark. Oh, I don't mind driving at night. Well, then why didn't you say so yesterday? That motel we stayed in was certainly no prize. Oh, not so bad. Anything to get away from Homer for a few days. Hmm, not from my point of view. Well, you can travel anywhere you want to at any time. Sometimes I do it only to keep from being bored. Nonsense. You don't know what being bored is like. I... I wanted to make this trip last longer. Really, Janet, it's an adventure for me. Well, I've enjoyed it, too. It's given us a chance to catch up. But I must say, this stretch of highway is deadly dull. Well, I wouldn't mind if it went so beastly hot. There's not a car in sight. Marion, I have an uncomfortable feeling that there are things ahead of us on the road. <laughs> I'm glad you're not driving. But don't you see those wavy lines? Shapes rising up, coming closer, and then fading away. Sure, heat haze. And over there, look, look. Nothing but bare, dry land and sagebrush. I swear I see buffalo. An Indian. <laughs> this terrible August heat has gone to your head. But I admit I'll be glad when we get to the next... Uh, uh-oh. What's the matter? We're losing speed. The accelerator isn't working. Oh, please, let's not have a breakdown way out here. Motor's dead. But we're miles and miles from anywhere. I know. Well, let's do something. We can't just sit here. Oh. I'm just running the battery down. Then we'll be in a worse mess. Are you absolutely sure we have gas? Well, of course I am. Look at the gauge. And you remember when we got it. I'll... I'll look under the hood. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Well, if you know what you're looking for. Good Lord, feel that blast of hot air. You'd better get back in while I check the manual. It's here, somewhere in the glove compartment. Marion! It must be 110 out here. Ouch! What's the matter? The hood. It's so hot I can't touch it. Well, get back in the car while the air conditioning lasts. We just better let the motor cool off. Cool off? In this blazing sun? Hurry, close the door. So now what do we do? I feel so helpless not knowing about what makes a car run or stop running. George always says, oh, skip it. I'm going to study this manual and see what happens when a motor's overheated. Maybe if I put on these gloves. Gloves in this weather? Well, then I could open the hood and look for a, a loose wire you or something. stay here. We'll think of something. I'm thinking very hard. No barn, no tree. Marion, what if we really are... Take it easy, uh, Janet. I said this trip was an adventure, so let's make the most of it. Then I suggest that we get out and start walking. Absolutely not. The best thing we can do is sit quietly here in the car. That's not my idea of an adventure. Someone's bound to come along. Janet? What? Look. Look over there. Is your window closed tight? Make sure. It's a dust storm heading straight for us. That's not a storm. It's someone coming. There's no road out there. Nevertheless, someone is coming. Well, they must be choking with dust. It's almost too thick to see us. We'll flag them. We'll flag them down. I'll get out and wave this scarf. Only, well, fantastic. It's, it's horses. And Janet. Janet, this is unbelievable. Look at what they're pulling. It's a mirage. It must be a mirage. No, no, they're real. Marion, you said I was suffering from heat Not haze. this time. You do see what I see, don't you? A covered wagon. And a man who looks at least 150 years old. Hey! Hey! hey. Morning, ladies. Good morning. 
Who, who are you? I'm usually called Old Timer, but my name is George. Well, that's my husband's name. I do not have the pleasure of knowing your husband, Miss Jeffries. Well, how do you know me? I've come to take you and Miss Marston to the village. He knows my name, too. Of course, I know your names. And now, if you will both come... You will fix the car for us, won't you? Oh, I have no idea whatsoever how you prepare these remarkable new conveyances. But you knew we were here. You you must have come to help us. Oh, yes, I, I am here to be of service. <laughs> come along, ladies. Mirado is expecting you. Mirado? Mirado is the town beyond the hill. What hill? Over that way. Well, it's perfectly flat. You'll see the hill when we get to it. But a hill can't... Please, a... ladies, step into my wagon. But we don't want to step into your wagon. Uh, we would like to be on our way. This is your way. I don't think you understand. We're going in this direction, straight ahead. Unless there's somewhere we can wait until help arrives. I have to get home. I mean, my husband's expecting me. Mr. Jeffries does not know what day this is. Well, we know what day it is. And both of us have to get back. We live quite a ways from here, but perhaps if I could call my husband... Oh, he would never hear you if you called from here, Miss Jeffries. Marion, I think this man is not quite right in the head. We don't want to bother you, Mr. Oldtimer. But what we really want is just to be on our way in my automobile. Ladies, your automobile will never take you to where we're going. But we're not going anywhere with you. Mr. Oldtimer, I think it would be best if you'd be good enough to go back to your town and ask a mechanic. A uh, mechanic? You know, a, a garage man. Someone who can fix an automobile. Why, no one in Mirado knows anything about automobiles. Marion, what are we going to do? I don't know. But if there is a town, as he says, I can't believe My orders they don't... are to take you to Mirado. What do you mean, your orders? Why... You have come to help us just as I'm here to help you. Well, then help us, will you please? Aye, that's better. Come along. You cannot sit here in the sun. Oh, he's right, Marion. And I'm getting terribly thirsty. At least we could get some water and, and find a telephone. A telephone? Don't tell me your town is that primitive. I've never been privileged to see a telephone. But you will send someone for help. I will take you to Murado. That is all I can do. How strange to be riding in a covered wagon. It's not nearly as uncomfortable as I thought it would be. That's your idea. At least the countryside is changing. It sort of lulls you. Why, look, Marion, there is a hill, and we're climbing. But the horses seem so tired and old. I mean, you think we're going to make it? We're almost there, down in the valley. That's Murado. Incredible. And Janet, look. There are houses. Houses. That means there must be water. We have a fine village pump. And people, and people who can help us. But this, this town is not on the map. I've studied the map very carefully. It shows nothing. Look down there, Miss Marston. See for yourself. Not very big, is it? But you must have a restaurant. We have a tavern and a church and a jail. What's the population? Well, that depends. Get along there, Jezebel. The street, Janet. Janet, where are the people? It looks... It looks deserted. No one round at this time of day. Why, Janet, it's a ghost town. Yes, you could call it that. But surely you don't live here alone. Oh, no, indeed. Now, will you please take us... Oh, no! Oh. <sighs> if you'll step down, ladies, you can get yourselves a drink at the town pump. I can hardly wait. Oh, this rusty old cup. But I'm thirsty enough to drink from anything. Mmm, 
I'd like to put my head under it. It feels wonderful on hands and arms. But it tastes so... Oh, so brackish. Hasn't been used in a long time. Now, where can we go for help? I will show you the points of interest. No sightseeing right now, please. But thank you. Do you have a, a telegraph office? Oh, no, indeed, Miss Jeffries. Scouts used to take our messages. Although there is now no reason to send a message. No reason? Tell us right now how to find someone who will go to the next town. Ladies, you are going to stay in Morado. Well, I suppose we're going to have to for an hour or two. You have come home, Miss Jeffrey. Oh, stop making jokes, Mr. Oldtimer. Morado is a place where people stay forever. Stay? In this deserted place? We'll soon see about that. Let's go to the mayor or to the police chief or someone, anyone in charge. You won't find them now. Not a soul till a stroke of noon. Why not? Someone must live in these houses. Where are the people? Asleep, Miss Marston. They're sound asleep. That store over there. Surely inside we'll find someone. No one there yet, Miss Jeffries. Well, I'm going to look anyway. Will you come with me, Marion? Yes, but it's all so quiet and eerie and... Not a sound. Oh, you'll hear sound, all right. In the barn, cross road, out in that field. What sort of sound? Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're not being very helpful. I don't like this place. Mr. Oldtimer, you have some explaining to do. You said we were expected. You are, dear ladies, you are. Who are you? How did you know our names? It was destined that you were the ones to be chosen this time. What are you talking about? Please, Mr. Oldtimer. Chosen for what? On the hottest day of the year, when the heat haze spreads across the desert, Mirado comes back to life and claims two people from the modern world. may be no new thing under the sun, but a frightening prospect confronts Marion and Janet if Mirado really has a living past. It is possible that George is merely a foolish old man, touched in the head by too much heat. But on the eerie streets of a ghost town, you never know what sinister forces may be at work. The two distraught ladies seem to be getting further away from help with each passing moment. We'll return to them and the old timer shortly with Act Two. Stranded on a lonely stretch of road when their car broke down. Marion Jeffries and Janet Marston have been taken to the strange ghost town of Mirado. In vain, they have tried to persuade their ancient escort to help them get back to civilization. But he has an unsettling way of insisting that they have come home to Mirado and that here they will stay. Their panic is growing with each new turn of events. Aside from the old man, there is no sign of life on the narrow streets. And so you see, dear ladies, we are happy to welcome you. We? You keep saying we. Where are the others? Later, Miss Marston. You'll meet them later. We really can't stay very long. Miss Jeffries, I'll show you to your quarters. My quarters? Truly, we are not planning to be here long. Come with me, both of you. We need you, Miss Jeffries, in the tavern here. Come, we'll go inside. Oh, I don't want to go in there. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. Come along. Janet, the pewter plates. Look, look. And the glassware. Oh, my, I'd like to take these home. Maybe we are in luck after all. Marion, I didn't touch it. Honestly, I didn't. I just put my hand toward that goblet and and it shattered. I... Follow me, ladies. The 
kitchen here is equipped in the best possible way. Why, it's covered with dust. That wood stove hasn't been touched for years. I think you will find that it will soon be ready for use. But who's going to use it? It's not for you, Miss Marston. <laughs> we have other plans. Uh, but we understand that Miss Jeffries is a very good cook. What are you talking about? This stove is for you, Miss Jeffries. <laughs> Marion, your reputation has really gotten around. Me? Cook on that? Oh, I believe you'll get used to it. Well, who, pray tell, is there to cook for? You'll meet them all at high noon. Marion, we have to get out of here. Oh, yes, Miss Marston. I'll show you to the place we have for you. For me? I'm leaving. We are both leaving. We have real need of a school teacher. And what makes you think that I know anything about teaching school? We know a great many things about both of you. But I haven't taught school We for... know that you like teaching school. And this is a fine opportunity... Stop it! I won't listen to any more. You said... Janet. That... Janet, I hear something. A voice from the barn. A voice? Oh, please make it a human voice. I'll be back at high noon, ladies. The bell on the church steeple will strike the hour. And then, at one o'clock, it will all be over. Janet, I'm terrified. He's a man-man. Listen. Oh, oh I hear it. Hurry. There's someone in that barn. It's a welcome sound for the crying baby. There must be a woman nearby. Help me. Help me to open the door. It's stuck. Well, we've got to open it. I think it's starting to move. This door hasn't been opened in years. Well, how could it pull harder? There. So dank and musty. What a place for a baby. The sound comes from over there. No, no, the sound comes from over here. Right here. The sound is right here, in the corner. Look, look in the corner. I don't see anything. It's so dark. A crib. Oh, what a lovely hand carved crib. You're right. This is a crib. But now he is. I know. I know. There's no baby in it. Marion, tell me you hear what I hear. A baby crying right here in this grave. But there is no baby. Are we losing our mind? Oh, Janet, be sensible. We both hear it. Well, there must be an explanation. Oh, I can't stand it. This spooky barn. Let's get out. Well, we can't just walk out on a crying baby. You look on that side, I'll go over here. But, Marion, I'm frightened. I always was afraid of the dark. Janet, Janet, we've got to keep our heads. That baby must be here somewhere. It's weird. There's no sense to any of this. Now, come on. There must be something about the acoustics of this old barn. You... The crying has stopped. Oh, Marion, I'm scared to death. Listen to that bell. Six. Seven. Eight. The old man kept talking about something happening at 12 o'clock. Let's get back to town. I tell you, I'm afraid. Well, you're the one who doesn't like the dark. We can't stay in here. But the baby that was crying. But there's no crying now. There must be a reason. Come on, we've got to find out. Look. Marion. Out on the road to town. People. Thank heaven. Those two men in the field. Let's go talk to them. How are they? They... They aren't moving. They look like statues. For that painting. Yes. It's the Angelus. And that girl who's running. Only she isn't running. She's standing still. Twelve. Twelve must be the magic number. That girl is moving now, and she's coming this way. Little girl? Little girl? 
Can you tell her stop? Please stop. We want to ask you a... She didn't hear us. She didn't even see us. Well, those two men. Let's, let's talk to them. Sir, would you tell us, please? Please, we don't want you to stop your work, but we do need your help. I mean, can... Where can... No use. They can't see us or hear us. This is impossible. They're here. Janet, you do see what I see, don't you? A man with a spade and a man with a hoe. Exactly. So I'm going to find out the way they're behaving. This can't be true. It can't be real. Nonsense. They're... They're ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. Now, I'm going to make this man talk to me. Look out. You'll be hurt. That hoe is sharp. This man is real. His hoe is real. Marion, don't go any closer. I'm going to touch him. No! Marion, no! You can't grab his arm. Mister, mister, you have to listen to me. He stopped breathing. I'm not sure he ever was breathing. But he's standing there. His eyes. Look at his eyes. Let go of him. It can't be. It can't be. He's going right back to work again. What about the other man? No use. It would be the same thing. We can try. No. Marion, I can see the look in his eyes, too. He's... He's dead. Just like the other one. Let's get away from here. Tony, where can we go? Well, I'm coming around... I'm coming around to your point of view. We must be very calm and think this whole thing out very sensibly. Let's move as far as possible away from these robots. How about that hillside over there? Well, maybe if we sit down in the shade of a tree, we'll come to our senses. Oh, it's peaceful here. But Janet, we can't stay here. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Maybe that old man was right. What do you mean? Perhaps you do belong in the kitchen. What a terrible thing to say. Oh, I'm only kidding, Marion. But you were the one who wanted adventure. Enough is enough. Today will last me for a lifetime. That's what I mean. You're talking very strangely. I feel strange. I felt strange all day. Ever since seeing those buffalo. What buffalo? Back on the road. When we were in the car. It all seems like such a long time ago. Oh, Janet. The heat... The heat haze. It, it's gotten to you again. Perhaps we're still back in that car. No, we're here. In Mirado. And that is the strangest part of all. Well, I agree that Mirado is a very unusual town. But now that it's 12 o'clock, if George was right, if we just go down to the center of things... Marion... Do you really believe there is such a town as Morado? But, Janet, you can see it from here. Just as clearly as I do. Listen. I've heard that sound before, when the old man came. No, but this is different. The way they're traveling, this must be young men. And they're heading down the main street. There, there must be someone who can help us. Ghosts. They're all of them ghosts. Janet, snap out of it. Come on. Come on. Where are we going? Back into town. I don't think I can stand any more of these ghostly people. But the horses, Janet. Maybe we can get some horses and ride away from this frightening place. I haven't been on a horse in a thousand years. Neither have I, but we can try. Oh, Janet, we can try. <laughs> They all look so busy. What did I tell you? See us, the time is over. Everyone's awake now. They're far from awake, Marion. The blacksmith shop's over there. And that should be the place to find out about the horses. Hello, ladies. How are you getting along? It's the old timer. Thank goodness, Mr. Old Timer. George, please, please, we can talk to you. At your service, ladies. You'd better be of more service than you were the last time. Well, I know it was you who brought us here, but we, you see, we simply don't understand. It's all very simple, Miss Jeffries. You heard the clock strike yes. 12? Yes, we heard the clock, and we can see the people. I had my orders. Everything will work out within the hour. Good. 
Then you will take us back to civilization. Nothing of the sort. As I told you before, you're staying here. But we don't belong here. Those other people, they're, they're ghosts. I've told you over and over again. You have been selected. But you said at 12 o'clock we would understand. And that everything would be all right. It is, dear ladies, it is. We need you, both of you, to go with the others. We'll pay you well, very well, for you to take us away from here. Anything you ask. I do only what I'm supposed to do for Mirado. There is no such place as Mirado. Right before your eyes, Miss Marston. As you said yourself, it's a very busy town. Oh, Janet, come on. We're going to the blacksmith shop. I wouldn't dare touch one of those horses. Oh, they look gentle enough to me. That gray one, for instance. I mean, are they real? Of course they're real. And that white-haired blacksmith. He's not like those other men. Look at those rosy cheeks. Most likely from all that heat. I must say the fire looks real enough. Excuse me. Um, please? Please stop for a moment. It's important. We... We want to hire two horses. No use talking to old Sam. He's deaf and dumb. They're all deaf and dumb, every one of them. Ladies, ladies, you've spent enough time in here. There's someone waiting for you. Well, why didn't you say that before? You, you found someone who can help us? Come along. We're going back to the tavern. Why, that sign in front of the tavern is new. It wasn't there before. Many people have been working. Uh, right this way, ladies. Through the swinging door. And the door. It isn't rusty anymore. Someone's oiled the hinges. <laughs> the place is crowded. Joe! Oh, Joe! Welcome back, old timer. Glad to see you. Did you bring her? Janet! Janet, he can talk! We found someone who can talk! <laughs> Things are looking up. Or are they? At least there seems to be one other living soul in Mirado. But why did Joe ask that question, did you bring her? Which one of the ladies does he mean? It doesn't sound as though he's going to help them get away. Marion and Janet may be in yet deeper trouble. And the mystery of this ghost town is far from solved. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. At the stroke of noon, the little town of Mirado seemed to burst into life. The streets are crowded now as people come out of their houses and go about what looks like normal, everyday business. And there are workmen in the fields. But something is wrong. If you or I should try to speak to these people, would they answer? Our two frightened travelers had no one to turn to except the old-timer. But at last, they have heard the sound of another human voice. A man named... Joe. I asked you, old-timer. Did you bring her? I certainly did. She's right here. Marion, which one of us is he talking about? Mr. Uh, Mr. Joe, is that your name? Did you explain to her that there is a great deal to be done? I tried. He didn't explain anything, Mr. Joe. You tell us. Oh, no use talking to him at this stage. He can't hear you. But he answered you. Why can't he talk to me? Not one o'clock yet. You're still in the other world. I'll make him talk. Your name is Joe. You run this tavern. Now, we need help. Old timer, did you show her the kitchen? Marion, it's you he's talking about. We've got plenty of complaints today about the food. Look at all the customers. Yeah, looks like a full house. Did you show her where everything is? Try to, but so far, she doesn't seem to quite understand. Oh, she will. You tell her we'll take real good care of her. Nobody ever any more popular around this town than the cook. What'd you say her name is? Miss Jeffries. Jeffries. You stop talking about me like that and talk to me. You hear? Like I told you, Miss Jeffries, 
He cannot hear you. He's got to hear me. Now, please, please, Mr. Joe. You look like a sensible man. You can tell us what this is all about, please. Well, George, got to be going. Trouble in the kitchen. See here. He can't see you either, Miss Jeffries. Not yet. You tell that new cook she's very welcome. You're going to like working for Joe. He's a fine gentleman. Stop it! I can't stand anymore. Janet, that sad-faced woman in the corner. Let's ask no her. No use. I already tried. Just like the rest. That's Miss Crawford. Oh. Widow lady. You'll find her a very good friend when you get to know her. I want to know her right now. Right this minute. You must be patient, dear lady. Not now. Uh, we're on our way to the schoolhouse. Everybody, get ready. Oh, Janet, what a darling one-room schoolhouse. No one-room schoolhouse was ever darling. What? These children are charming. What do you think of them, Miss Marston? Well, they all look like normal, healthy children to me. Only I know they're not. Oh, I don't know from minute to minute what to believe anymore. You had better believe, Miss Marston. Children are doing this especially for you. They look as though they're singing. They are. And very nicely, too. Well, then why can't I hear them? Why? In time. You'll hear them when you are their teacher. But I'm not going to be their teacher. Miss Marston, our teacher is old, as you can see. All the children have learned songs and games. I didn't think anyone still used those little bells. What are they going to do now? I think it's time for arithmetic. Oh, what a bright-looking little girl. The one going up to the blackboard. Yeah, you see? Seven times nine... Seven times nine does not equal 56. That's just what I mean, Miss Marston. But that teacher is nodding her head. This is outrageous. It's just as I told you, we need someone like you around here. Why, I'm going up to that blackboard and put her straight. Oh, no, Miss Marston. You can't do that yet. But I'm going to. Don't do it, Miss Marston. Children, children, this number on the blackboard is wrong. Here's the way it goes. Oh, dear, this chalk, it, the chalk won't write on the blackboard. Don't worry, Miss Marston. Here, young lady, you take the chalk and I'll show you the right answer. gone back to that game. Here, now I want to show you something. It's no use, Miss Marston. None of them can see you. Well, then why did you bring me here? So you'd know what to do later on. You keep saying that. We've been looking for someone like you for a long time, Miss Marston. And you've come to us at last. You will be there, teacher. You must be joking. Everything is a ghastly, hideous joke. That will be enough, children. It's time for us all to go. Marion, I have a feeling that the stage is being set for some tremendous catastrophe. The hour is approaching, and I must get to my station. Old timer, old timer, please don't leave us. George, George, you are our only hope. It's one o'clock. Hurry, hurry, run to the town hall. Marion, listen, listen. I heard the clock start one, but the people, they're all talking now, all of them, and they can see us. Look, look, they're beckoning to us. Let's catch up. <laughs> it's dusty. Storm. <laughs> the beginning of a terrible storm. Look, look over there. I told you. I told you. What did you tell me? This morning when I saw those buffalo and, <coughs> and the Indians. The town hall. Hurry, hurry. a stinking piece of road. Come on. It's my favorite stretch of highway. <laughs> Glass not my Pete. Well, if you had the right car, you could do 200 miles an hour along here. Yeah, well, watch it, bud. A cop's supposed to set an example. Bet I can do 150. Shall we uh, try? No, no thanks. <laughs> you never make it in this thing. And we're supposed to be saving gas, remember? Ah, this road's only fun when you drive as fast as you can. Especially on a day like today. 
You know, Sweeney, sometimes I just feel sorry for the poor slobs we haul in for speeding on stretches like this. Yeah, right along here's the best place to get them. You, you actually come out here on purpose just to give them speeding tickets? Mm. Sometimes, when I have nothing better to do. <laughs> hey, 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 slow down, will you? Why, why? There's something up there on the road. Heat haze. No, 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 no. Come on now, Sweeney. Slow down, will you? Hey. I think you're right. It's a stalled car, that's for sure. Yeah, rotten place to run out of gas. California plates. Nobody in it. Maybe they're sleeping. Well, we'll soon find out. Uh, this is supposed to be your day off. But I'm still on duty, so here goes. No, no, no. I'm coming, too. Man, feel that heat. Nobody in the car, Sweeney. Oh, they'd be crazy if they were. I got the license number. If it's unlocked, there should be a registration. Find anything? Yep. Belongs to a Mr. George Jeffries, Vallejo Street, San Francisco. You want me to get that down? Okay. But where's Mr. Jeffries? Wait a minute. Ladies' gloves in here. And a scarf. <laughs> Guess he wasn't traveling alone. It yeah, looks like women's luggage on the back seat, too. Say, you don't suppose it was some dame who got stuck way out here all by herself, do you? No. No, it's my hunch that there were at least two people in this car. Mm. But whoever they are, they took the ignition key. Air conditioning. But that wouldn't work if the motor conked out. Yeah. Well, which, which way do you think they'd go? Wouldn't be stupid enough to walk on such a hot day. Well, they got a ride. Well, we didn't pass anybody coming this way. They must have gone straight ahead. Yeah. Could have been some time ago. So what do you think? Should we push the car off the road? Uh-uh. Cars in plain sight. No traffic. And Midway's only about ten miles. We'll find a better... Maybe I should stay here. Oh, you're off. Well, I mean, just, just in case, you Look, know. I'm sorry we don't have the patrol car. If we did, I checked with headquarters. I'll make my report, and if there's any trouble, you can come back with me. We'll bring the tow truck. Okay. I got it all down. Mm -hmm. Sedan, color blue. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Get in, and let's go. There's something in this book I want to check. What are you carrying that thing around with you for? Boy, what a rookie. Well, I haven't worked this territory as long as you have. Maybe they'll assign me to a car out here. Oh, just ask me anything. I just want to make sure that there isn't some other town or farm or someplace where those people could have gone. Oh, nothing but desert for miles in every direction. Well, let's just see. The baker. The razor. Hey, Sweeney, huh? listen to this, will you? Listen to what? Ever hear of town called Mirado? Mirado? It's not around here. Well, it's a ghost town, or at least it was. Old trading post. Uh, maybe a hundred years ago. No, longer than that. Well, then who cares about it today? I do. You know, you're really something. Well, just a minute. Can I read it to you? Read it, read it. Since I got nothing better to do, go on, go on, read it. It says here that, uh, in August of 1846, a band of bloodthirsty Indians swooped into the little town of Mirado and killed all but one of its inhabitants. All but one? The lone survivor was a baby boy who was found asleep in a crib in a barn. There is a legend that once a year, the residents of Mirado come back to haunt the place. Now, what do you think of that? <laughs> I think it's poppycock, made up for the tourist trade. Hey, look over there, that great big spiral of smoke. Oh, Johnson, you're a fool. That's a dust storm, and it's coming our way. Come on, step on it. If anyone else drove as fast as I'm about to, even you would arrest him for speeding. people believe in predestination, and almost everyone at some time in life comes across a ghost. Our traveling ladies may have met with an unfortunate accident, 
Or perhaps they really were sojourners in time who found a better or at least a different place to fit into the scheme of things. The ghosts of times past are all around us and legends persist. The present is made up of the past and a clock of one century tells time in another. I'll be back shortly. Be grateful for the energy crisis this summer. It may keep you from driving along a deserted highway. Check your automobile and drive with care. There could be a ghost town waiting for you. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Francis Sternhagen, Nat Polan, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I've got some clues. I have those tire marks. They made a mold five years ago. And I've got this. This little button made of bone. It was clutched in Grover's hand. You take a look at it. I looked. It was a little button. A sleeve button. From a corduroy jacket. One of, well, one of a host of buttons that adorned that jacket. The jacket I had worn that night. I never even noticed the one that was missing. That jacket. I still have it. I don't wear it often. But I still have it. It's in one of my closets. What you're saying is that if you can find the jacket it came from, you've got your killer. That's right. I've got it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WBBM Chicago.